Does your EDM machine suffer from frequent spurts? Does it wake up five, six times in the middle of the night? Stop that now. Improve your flow. Get EDM Blaster. Only $48,000. Hey there, Internet. So today I want to walk you through my EDM setup. I put a couple videos up of boring, sizzling bacon sounds. So this is the second iteration of a circuit. It's not really ideal, but it does work somewhat. The way the circuit's set up, just this, I changed this uh, MOSFET. So this is, I'm actually using an IRF uh, 3205 here. Uh, this, this didn't work out. But the way that the circuit is set up is I've got uh, in the yellow box here, I have MOSFET A and the blue box I have MOSFET B. And I've got a couple capacitors that are providing the energy for the sparking. Um, both of these are the, exactly the same. But the majority of this part of the circuit is a kind of a modified totem pole gate driver. And because the switching frequency of this MOSFET is going to be between 5 and 10 kilohertz, you need to be able to have enough power to, there's a, there's a capacitor essentially between the source, the source and the gate. And so you, you can't really, you're not going to be able to put enough current through an ESP32, which is what I'm using to, to send the signal. You're not going to be able to put enough current uh, to switch fast enough. So you need a gate driver. I didn't have a gate driver on hand, so I found a totem pole circuit. And um, what I'm using is uh, an NPN uh, 2N5551 and a PNP 2N5401. And I have a, this is actually running at 14 volts. And this is providing all the energy to turn the MOSFET on and off. The MOSFET is low side. Uh, and channel MOSFET. And so what that does is you've got this, the main power source, which I'm running between 42 and 35 volts. That 40 volts goes to one of your electrodes. There's a spark gap between the, these two parts of the circuit. And when you get to some distance where the dielectric and the EDM dielectric, which is, I'm just using water, um, where that breaks down, the spark will jump across and there's a kind of a, it runs at a higher voltage on the initial spark creation as the dielectric breaks down. And then you get a sustained spark, which is powered by these MOSFETs. And that's what actually erodes the metal away. So basically I've got my ESP32 sending a signal here, um, turns the circuit on. If it's close enough, it, the spark will get created, then it'll turn the circuit off. And then over here, I've got a separate pin on the ESP32, and that will go ahead and power this other gate driver. So they're, they're interleaved. So you go A, B, A, B, A, B. It's running at about a 20% duty cycle. And uh, it's running, again, between 5 and 10 kilohertz. And down here, I just have a simple... Um, down here, I have a simple voltage divider that then I can feed back to the ESP32 to do some control. Um, the way it works now, I'm not actually using this signal for anything. Uh, there's a Zener diode here to make sure that there's, um, you know, that I don't exceed the 3.3 volts for the input pin on the ESP32. And then there's a input diode here just to make sure I don't get any negative voltage uh, to fry my ESP32. So that's essentially the basic circuit. Now, more ideally, what I would do is I would have another MOSFET on the high side of the circuit that will charge the capacitors. And that'll probably be the next thing that I try. So you'll have a high side MOSFET, it'll charge the capacitor, then that'll turn off. And then the low side MOSFET will turn on, allow it to spark, then turn off, and then re rinse and repeat. And that way I can, I can control the capacitors separately. Right now they're, if this one, uh, if this one turns on, both capacitors discharge. And if this one turns on, both capacitors discharge. What I'd like to be able to do is control uh, the capacitor banks for each module uh, individually. Um, 
I, unfortunately, I don't really, I don't think I have enough cooling um, on both of these MOSFETs to run it much hotter than it currently is. The uh, power feed for this 40 volts is a, is a current limited supply. It's an RD6012, and that's actually working really well. Um, and when it current when it current limits, the voltage will drop down to you know, two or three volts, and I can that's what I can detect. So if I have a short, I can just I can I can look at the voltage. I can also put a Hall effect current sensor in line, uh, probably over here, and that would give me additional feedback as to how much current is actually dumping through the uh, through the MOSFET. The final thing I really wish I had is a temperature feedback on the MOSFET so that I could that I could throttle this or throttle the whole system once I get a, above a certain a, once I get above a certain amount of heat in in the MOSFET. I've blown five or six MOSFETs fooling around with this and running running things too hot. Now they do make a special kind of MOSFET called a hit MOS, I think it's called. And, it, and that actually has an integrated temperature control and it will self-regulate if the MOSFET gets too hot. That's what I really need for this application because everything else is, you know, probably I would say so poorly done. So I wanna, I'm gonna show you the setup and I'm gonna show you a burn with a, a copper electrode through a razor blade, but I just wanna just briefly touch on some of the issues. The, the first, I mean, the biggest issue, and I think the thing that is, doesn't get enough attention is the filtering um, as well as the tank. So I'm, I'm using a cast iron pot. And the nice thing about that is I can put a vise in the pot and use magnets to hold the vise still. But if I didn't have that, I don't know how I would, you know, do the work holding because you, you, you have to make a, a custom tank and you know, that's, that's a, quite a lot of work. So the magnet plus the cast iron pot seems to be working pretty good, but I don't. I, I think I only have about a gallon of water in the whole system, and it, that's definitely not enough. And I don't have any active filtering, so I'm using water out of my refrigerator filter, which is actually better than the distilled water that I have. Um, it's it's got about 250k resistance um, with the the square resistance setup that I have. I'll show you later uh, exactly how much the resistance changes after doing a couple small burns. But um, I don't have a, a deionized water source, and I also don't have a ion exchange filter. And I think, you know, if you're gonna get serious about doing this, you're gonna need both of those. I don't know how well the, you know, the, the home style deionization de setups how, how much they actually, you know, if they produce a high enough quality water for this use case, um, you might be able to buy something off of Amazon and plumb it in, but it, you could spend 150 bucks on that and it may not actually, it may not actually produce the quality of water that you actually need. Uh, I have a couple different pumps. I hate all of them. I, uh, the, the, right now the setup, if I, if I, if I battery power the setup, I don't have um, electrical noise issues, but if I if I use one of the voltage sources that I have set up for the stepper controller, uh, I have all kinds of problems with the with electrical noise, plus audible noise. I mean, running the pump, it's loud and it's annoying, and <laughs> I just I just don't like the pump setup that I have. So ideally, I'd have a pump that was really nice and quiet, and I could just listen to the sound of the water trickling through the system. But that's not how it's set up now. So uh, having the right kind of pump is something that I don't have and I find super annoying. Um, homing is, is kind of an issue. Um, right now, I don't have a homing routine set up and you, you could, I guess what you, one of the things that you could do is uh, use the sensing function in the circuit and have that figure out a way to, to do the homing. But sometimes the probe gets some gunk between it and the, and the material that you're cutting. And so you, not only do you need to be able to sense when you home, but you also need to be able to sense when you're actually touching and you don't want to lose steps. So what I think I could do is like, so what I think I can do is have essentially a spring and then I would have my probe, you know, my electrode on the spring and then up, up here, 
I'd have a, you know, like a micro switch so that when the, uh, oh, of course you won't go the right direction. <laughs> so when this travels up and presses the button, then I know that I've made, I've made contact with the work down here. So I've, I'm in the work, but I'm not, I'm feeding down, but it's, it's pushing the probe up and the, and the spring would, you know, there shouldn't be any contact. So the, all the spring would do is hold this off unless I do have contact, which will then push this up, flip the switch, and then I can, I can retract. Uh, and, and start the cut back down again. But that would also allow me to do homing fairly easily. I could just seat down until that, that spring pushes down. And then if I know the, the travel distance of the spring, I can find the top of the surface. And then the final thing, right now I'm just using gerbil with no feedback. And I've, wrote, I've written some G code that will seems to step at a rate that's reasonable. But I'm kind of debating whether or not I write, you know, I've, I've used RTM in the ESP32. There's a RTM module that uh, works really well for generating stepping sig signals. And so I'm debating whether or not I write a custom driver that can do the retractions and can manage the speed all based on the controller input, or if I use gerbil and then just do try to use G code and send G code directly to the, to the gerbil controller. And that, that, the nice thing about that is I get all the acceleration and motion coordination with that. Um, but I'd have to use feed overrides or, you know, just send little short bursts of um, G code. And then I'd have, to, I'd have to write a G code generator that would give me the motion that I need that would accept the feedback. So I'm not sure which one of those is actually easier, but uh, that's, that's, that would be a next step that I'm, I would need to do. So here's my setup. I got a little cooling fan, uh, a bigger MOSFET because this one seems to run hotter. I've got a second MOSFET here. Looks like there's some chip clearing. I made a, kind of a pretty major design mistake on the PCB. So I've just got these two uh, 47 microfarad low ESR caps. And then that's connected to, those caps are connected to this red lead. And then the black lead comes back to the drain of the MOSFETs. Here's this awful uh, pump setup that I have. I've got a Arduino Uno, and the uh, the Uno. Well, I put I did a Pro V or a Pro Micro, and uh, when I plugged it into 12 volts, the the regulator just blew up in a little puff of magic smoke. So then I had to wire this together, and then I've got it connected to this this motor driver here. Um, and then here's the pump, which vibrates like crazy. It just creates a whole huge amount of vibration, which is just no good. And I want to isolate that from the, the table so that the, the electrode isn't vibrating around. So I hooked it up to this, which is hooked up to an ATX power supply. And this has my stepper also hooked up to it. it I, you know, I guess there's EMF happening. So every time the... Every time I get uh, any kind of a short, the it's triggering the switch, which is turning the pump on and off. Now, I had it hooked up to this earlier, which is this battery adapter. And this worked great. I didn't have any problems with the noise. But the problem is, is this awful device, this this requires like 500 milliamps of power or, or it'll shut the, the, the 12 volt port off. And so if I turn the pump off, there's not enough current being drawn, and then it turns the power off, which turns the Arduino off, which means I can't turn the pump back on, which is just this terrible nightmare. <laughs> so I, uh, I hooked it up to that uh, ATX power supply, and, and now I've got electrical interference noise. So I can't win with this. I mean, I, I blew up a microcontroller. Uh, I mean, I went through so much to get this pump. It's just embarrassing how much it took to get this pump, and I hate it. So... Yeah, that's pretty awful. Let's go look at the, the, the something else. I'm going to go ahead and stop it, and I'll pull the part out, and then we'll look at the, the cut. So here's, here's the cut that I just made. The back, it's this cut here. So the electrode, where did I put the electrode? So here's the electrode fit.
so there's really almost no overburn in it so I'd say that's that's pretty decent um, the electrode I should have measured it before before I um, before I did the cut it, it looks like it's it really very little erosion happened there um, I didn't have any feed into the um, the top uh, with this just this is only 0.6 millimeters it's kind of unnecessary but um, I did I tried it I did squirt some water at it and it was just it was just uh, coming back up out the top so I don't really have a way to put a gasket on this yet I'm gonna try to burn a hole with a piece of copper into a into a I guess it's probably not stainless steel into a razor blade I don't even know what it's made out of some kind of steel razor blade let's do it engage the pump <laughs> what I can't even turn the, the power on without the pump triggering okay as soon as you turn the camera on everything quits working I'm going to pulse the pump, I guess. <laughs> That's awful. This is my waveform. The pump has got a mind of its own. So the uh, light blue trace is MOSFET A, and the dark blue trace is MOSFET B. Let me see if I can separate channel one a little bit. Channel one is the um, Channel wants the uh, drain to source voltage. 